Sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get over 2,400 documentaries for free for 31 days. Link in the description. Welcome, thank you so much for joining me. I'm Renee Ritchie and this is Vector. Despite the usual doom and gloom reporting that we got leading up to Apple's Q3 2019 financial results, or stock manipulation, depending on your point of view, the company managed to largely beat expectations, but not escape the doom and gloom, at least not entirely. I get that there are people in press that are glass half empty, and some, like myself, who tend towards glass half full, but increasingly, all we're seeing is glass smashed and all that tasty beverage spilled out all over the table. That's just a waste of good beverage. iPhone revenue was down 12% year over year, but the active install base, those billion phones in our pockets, y'all, was up thanks to switchers, upgraders, and new customers alike. Mac and iPad were both up. Services revenue, which includes Apple Music and Apple Care, was up 13%. Wearables, which includes Apple Watch, AirPods, and Beats, was up 50%. So, what's the problem? Well, depending on how you tilt your head and squint, factoring in seasonality and a myriad of other factors, for the first time since 2012, the iPhone accounted for less than half of Apple's revenue. And, where Apple was previously accused of being far too dependent on iPhone sales, now, going beyond the iPhone is seen as just as worrisome and troubling. The age of iPhone is over, or the post-iPhone age is just beginning. Since then, there's been just so much noise and so much dumb, I just wanted to do something smart. So I got analyst Neil Seibart of Above Avalon on the line to help us sort it all out. Yeah, I think what tends to happen is a lot of the earnings previews that are out there, they focus on just a few big numbers. And so they'll maybe look at iPhone revenue and they'll see that it's down and that's about the extent. And then the rest of the article is trying to explain why is it down and what is Apple trying to do in response. And I think in reality, when you take a closer look at the results and you look at, okay, what's going on with the wearables business? What's going on with services? Even what's going on with the iPad and Mac, which are surprisingly showing quite a bit of stabilization, especially for the iPad. That's when you get a a, a different picture. I think you get a, a more detailed overview of what's really going on and you'll find there's a lot more moving pieces at play. And I do tend to think some of the narratives that are out there, they're off the mark because they're not able to capture all of those moving pieces. So when people start to talk about we're entering the post iPhone age, does that resonate with you? And, and if so, what is what are they trying to say by that? I think a lot of the post iPhone narrative is about where will Apple turn to next for growth or where will they generate revenue going forward? And in that respect, I think it's logical that a lot of people are making that claim for this quarter simply because of what's going on. We have the non iPhone yeah. part of the business doing well and the iPhone business struggling in terms of growth. And what happened was each basically offset each other. I tend, I think a little bit differently though about this narrative of, of post iPhone era. I go back to when Apple began to working on different product categories like wearables, like okay. revamping the content distribution arm. That started a while ago. Apple Watch launched 2015. We have AirPods out for a couple years now. So I think this past quarter, it wasn't the start of some new era at Apple, some new post iPhone period. I think it's just the latest sign of what Apple has been working toward. And so what you see Apple doing is saying, well, here are additional devices that you will likely enjoy so much that you're willing to pay for. And here are additional services as well as Apple wants to control a little bit more about um, what we do on those devices. So it's, it's one thing just to have more than 1.4 billion devices, but we're doing a lot of on those devices. We're giving those devices yeah. more of our time throughout the day. And Apple's starting to say to themselves, we think there's some areas for us to play a bigger role in, in how you use those devices. So um, I, I think you're starting to see, like, there's certain metrics that I follow. Maybe you could look at average revenue per user and you're looking at the entire Apple install base and then you could break that down into just the iPhone users or maybe just people who enter the Apple ecosystem through the gray market. So maybe they bought yeah. 
yeah. a used or a refurbished iPhone. What you're seeing Apple do is launch all of these new products and services. And I think people are slowly or maybe gradually becoming more engaged with the ecosystem. And that is something that we're seeing play out quarter after quarter. Again, it's not something that you're going to see all at once, but maybe over the span of two or three years, it's going to add up. And I think that's what's happening with wearables and also services. So when you look at the iPhone business now and you sort of look ahead into the near term future, where do you see it? I think the big issue with the iPhone right now is that people are holding on to their devices longer. And it's not too surprising because as a new iPhone comes out, I think in some ways it's handling our use cases. It's doing a much better job at handling our current use yeah. cases. And so, whereas a couple of years ago, maybe we had the tendency of going out and upgrading every year or two, on average, it's, it's longer. And so you're seeing that play out from a unit sales perspective. And I think the other issue here, which is a little bit harder to gauge, is the global economy and where you have uh, foreign currency impacting prices. And so on, on one hand, in the US, we're sort of familiar with iPhone prices and, and we everyone focuses on say the thousand dollar iPhone, but in many countries, the prices have been much higher. And so I do think that yeah. has played a role in people saying, well, wait a second, I, I'm probably not gonna upgrade my iPhone this year. The price is, is now a certain level. And so you're seeing Apple do things like price cuts outside the US, really just to try to bring that pricing back to levels that here in the US we're used to. They're also doing a little yeah. bit more in a way, or a lot more in the way of kind of juicing those trade-ins. And so we know that a lot of people buying iPhone uh, in 2019, they have an iPhone already. And so what do you do with that iPhone? Yeah. Trade it in. And Apple's trying to make it seem like, okay, well, if you trade it in, the price for the new one is a lot lower. And so I think what's happening is you're seeing demand actually improve. It's still down. Unit sales, my estimate is it's probably down around uh, between 5 and 10% on a sell-through basis, but I do think that's actually gonna improve a little bit as we go forward for the next couple of quarters. You also have, and this is just this is just an inevitable thing with financial modeling, when you have a really bad quarter one year, the next year, it's an easier compare. And so I think once yes. we start <laughs> in 2020, Apple's gonna be facing that, what was really a bad quarter in the first quarter and continue to the second quarter. So it is possible that the iPhone business actually starts to stabilize a tad. My estimates have iPhone revenue it's still down in 2020, but um, maybe not by much. And again, I'm not making too many claims in terms of a 5G iPhone causing a huge rush in upgrades. I know some analysts like to still kind of push the the mega upgrade cycle. Yeah. I'm not one of those. I, I I tend to think that we are simply going to hold on to these phones for longer as time goes on. Yeah. Um, but I think what ends up happening is just given the size of the install base, even if the upgrade rate slows, there's still a lot of people out there that are going to upgrade. You have somewhere around, what, what's my latest estimate? Something probably 925 million iPhones out in the wild. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of people. And so even if you assume, okay, the average person holds on to it three or four years, that's going to kick off a certain number of, of upgrades every year regardless. And so, yes, a lot of people made, uh, they noticed this past quarter that the non-iPhone business was actually more than the iPhone business. It's a little bit trickier because the third quarter is typically the weakest for the iPhone business. Yes. So that may not continue, say, next quarter, or especially for the first quarter, that's the big one for the iPhone. But I think it's correct to look at that big picture and say, yes, you, you start to see what's happening here. And that is that newer product categories where Apple's been putting a lot of R&D in wearables, content distribution services, uh, those are gaining momentum. And with the iPhone business, even if it stabilizes, which I think is good for Apple, um, you're still going to have that non-iPhone business show stronger growth 
both in terms of the absolute dollars and the percentages. So you could say that maybe this quarter was a peak of what we're probably going to expect going forward. So where does the Mac then fit into this for you? Because Apple is relatively unique. You know, Microsoft was not able to create a new platform, so they've had to bring Windows and the PC forward into the mobile age, where Google never had a traditional computer platform. And so they've started with Android and with Chrome, and they exist fully in the modern mobile age, where Apple has to straddle both worlds, sometimes to the benefit and sometimes one against the other. Uh, and yet the Mac still seems to be going strong for them right now. It's been fascinating to see, I think you could call it an evolution in how they're approaching the Mac. I, I, there's a good amount of evidence to say that they've made some major changes to the way they're approaching yeah. a category in recent years. I tend to think of the Mac as, uh, they wanna position it as a content creation platform um, for use cases that may not have necessarily a home on something like the iPad, which I do also think Apple's positioning uh, over time as a content creation platform. And yeah. so in some ways you see Apple, they've decided that they're gonna push both the iPad and Mac at the same time, uh, push it forward. And I think a couple years ago it was a little bit different where I think Apple, um, I, I kind of describe it as they were pulling the product categories forward and the Mac was at the end of that rope. And I think it was at yeah. risk of just kind of being, uh, kind of falling off the rope. So I do think they're getting more aggressive. That could be seen with more, um, more of a sustained schedule for upgrades um, or updates. Um, I do think you're also going to see uh, new models. And so this idea of, well, Maybe the iPad starts to eat a portion of the Mac. Again, maybe a couple years ago, that argument was stronger. But now I do tend to believe them when they say that the Mac's future, if you're a Mac user, is looking brighter. From my perspective, the question is, how do you grow the Mac install base? And I do think that's more challenging for Apple. I tend to think if you're comparing the Mac to iPad and iPhone, there's really now, there's not gonna be any catching up. You're gonna have the iPhone at multiple times the size in terms yeah. of ecosystem, in terms of install base versus the iPad. And I do think the iPad's gonna be multiple times the size of the Mac. But um, you know, as, you know, as we saw at WWDC in that demo room, uh, they're clearly targeting the Mac, not just at a portion of, of, of content creators, uh, but but a very, very small portion. Now. They, they seem to push really hard on the mainstream at the expense of the very high-end pros, and now it seems like they're focusing on the very high-end pros, but I'm not sure what that means for the mainstream yet. No, I think that I think that's totally right, yeah. And, and I think, and that's the other thing, when you look at the sales for the Mac, um, those lower-end models continue to sell really well. And I think the most surprising thing about the Mac is about half of sales are going to people new to the Mac. Yeah. And I hear from a lot of people who are longtime Mac users, they're still using older devices. They're, they're using those older MacBook Pros. And so if you do see Apple become aggressive with updates, uh, maybe you know, kind of <laughs> make some changes to the keyboard, you could see even a surge of upgrade. I'm gonna wait for the first analyst to say keyboard super cycle. <laughs> Correct, yeah. <laughs> All right, so last question. As you look into Q4 and then beyond that Q1 and, and you know potential devices from the September event, maybe another October event, new iPhones, new iPads, uh, new Apple Watches, what are you going to be looking for? I think when, when, whenever you're looking at a new iPhone or you could say an Apple Watch, I'm always interested in is that new device better than last year's device. And I know better is a, a subjective, subjective term, but I'm thinking if you are using that newest iPhone, that newest Apple Watch, do you still have an urge to go back and use an older model? If the answer is no, and that means that the newest iPhone, the newest Apple Watch is truly the best, I think that's a very important thing. And that tends to get lost in a lot of the financial discussion because everyone's focused yep. on unit sales. They're focused on upgrading. Um, but f especially for the iPhone, Apple is at that tricky point where you don't want to overserve users here. And so we can even look at the camera. 
a lot of people are satisfied with the camera that they have. And so it's very interesting. It's going to be very interesting to see how do they go forward in terms of having new features, bringing new technology that people say, you know what, I actually have a use for that in my life. I think I may want that newest device. It's going to be easier to do with the Apple Watch just because it's a newer product. You're going to see larger upgrades year over year. Uh, so that, that's the thing that I've been focusing on the iPhone in particular in recent years. Um, and then, of course, I am looking for those surprises, and that is, uh, do we see Apple expand the, the wearables platform? And that would be, yeah. in the near term, I'm primarily looking at, I, I, I call the wearables, I, I think of it as battles for real estate on our body. And so <laughs> the smartwatch is a battle for real estate on our wrist wireless AirPods, real estate in it for our ears. It's possible that Apple will expand its product lineup for the ear. And, and I think that's gonna be really interesting to consider when you're thinking yeah. of the wearables platform where all of these devices are coming together. If you have an Apple Watch, are you a little bit more likely to buy that pair of wireless AirPods? I tend to think the answer is yes, or maybe even right, vice versa. If you have a wireless uh, AirPods, you're more likely to buy another wearables device. So that's something that I'm considering yeah. when the fall comes and, and you do have, really that's tr 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 traditionally Apple's product upgrade cycle, trying to get everything ready for the holidays. Uh, and, and yeah, and, and I, I do also think that my attention is gonna be on some of these new content distribution services. There's still things that we don't know about Apple TV Plus. Pricing. <laughs> <laughs> the clues would suggest that they're, they're going to charge for something. I think there were some yeah. people thinking that um, how are they going to compete with something like Disney um, and all these other uh, direct-to-consumer streaming bundles. Anyone with catalog content. Right, exactly. I mean, you're going to have Apple <laughs> come out with a pretty limited amount of content launch, how is that going to impact pricing? And I think the big question is, do you see some type of bundle? Because right now, if you are engaged in the Apple ecosystem, you're, you're starting to have a lot of Apple subscriptions here. Um, you have different renewal yes. dates, you gotta keep track of everything. The argument, the, the case for an Apple bundle is getting stronger where you just and yeah. your whole family can subscribe to all of these different bundles you can throw in a discount in there to um you know if you subscribe to multiple bundles so i would I, I will be watching that in the coming months to see if there's any clues and of course apple arcade we don't have pricing for that either yeah uh, so yeah it, as it stands now it's shaping up to be a pretty busy september into october and that's the other thing when you look at guidance for the first quarter, let's see, for the fourth quarter, 2019, guidance was pretty decent. So that would suggest that, I think my estimate is Apple's probably expecting overall iPhone sales to be uh, maybe down a little bit, just by 5%. Of course, okay. the timing is a little bit different. I mean, last year you had one iPhone model launch in October. That threw things off from the quarterly yeah. financial perspective, but things do appear to be, shaping up that you're going to have a pretty decent uh, September <laughs> in terms of new products. So <laughs> so that I think a lot of people are probably going to be waiting for that. <laughs> Thanks again, Neil. Really appreciate it. You can find Neil at Neil Seibart on Twitter and subscribe to his site and newsletter at Above Avalon. And if you want the smart beyond Apple, check out Catalyst on CuriosityStream. It's the premier science news show that takes us deeper into the science of now and the future, what Facebook knows about you, the AI race, and much, much more. Curiosity Stream has over 2,400 documentaries and nonfiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. It's the world's first streaming service to address our lifelong quest to learn, to explore, to understand. Go to curiositystream.com slash vector for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series and enter promo code vector to start your membership completely free for the first 31 days. Thanks Curiosity Stream, and thanks to all of you for supporting vector. So is Apple doomed? Mostly doomed, not doomed at all. Is the age of iPhone over? Mostly over, peaked but far from fallen. And are services and wearables enough to be what's next? Hit like, hit subscribe, flying elbow that bell gizmo so you don't miss the next video, and then hit up the comments below and let me know. What do you think? Thank you so much for watching and see you next video.